but this is Duca on the move for Montreal. Dilly Duca, let's see what he does. A left foot shot, that's in! Dilly Duca beat his man, and the Rutgers product makes it 1 0 Montreal. This is Off the Woodworks with Kevin Laramie, the longest running podcast entirely dedicated to the Montreal Impact. It's wide open now, Malice. Plenty of room. As Pachuca have five players lined up across the back. An opportunity! It's Paris for Montreal! The rookie! Bedlam at the big O! Good day, good night, and welcome to a brand new edition of Afterward Works. Today on the show, we're going to review a little bit the nil-nil draw of Montreal versus the New England Revolution last Saturday in New England. But most of all, what comes out of that game is the loss of Cameron Porter to a season-ending injury. Uh, yes, it, it is very unfortunate, very sad when you put yourself in the shoes of Cameron Porter, how he was on top of the world in Montreal, the new darling of Montreal as a whole, as a city. It was falling in love with that kid. But uh, unfortunately, circumstances decided otherwise. And the way he landed, we all knew that something was going to happen with his knee. And we all knew that his left knee was going to be gone for a long time. 9 to 12 month absence right now. That's the estimate. That's the prognostic. We'll see if that's the case. Maybe he's a... Uh, drinks the same water as a Max Patch ready in hockey and heals faster, who knows. But our thoughts and our well wishes to Cameron Porter. Hope for the best, hope for the better, and who knows, you might come even faster. Hopefully you'll be even better then. And hopefully, the only sad thing, uh, it's a sad thing, but the only good thing in that sad thing is he's young enough that that type of injury might heal might heal better or heal more properly than it would do if he gets that same injury 26 28 years old so that's the only small positive out of that very bad blow and now that's two that's justin matt out for four months uh approximately because of a elbow dislocation and now cameron porter with a acl damage on his left knee out for nine to twelve months ah it's it's heartbreaking in a way, but Montreal's got to continue. They got to dust themselves off, get off that pitch, and move it on. And they did in that game. Jack Mack came in, and he wasn't really dangerous, but at least they didn't concede on the road. They were not able to score, but Lee Wen, Jermaine Jones was not uh, active, but still a lot of players were for New England, and they're still scoreless. So even if Montreal hasn't won yet in MLS, lost their first game 1-0 against D.C. and now 0-0 against New England, well, Montreal's got a point on the road. They clawed and fought for that point. Uh, Asun Camara, red card, two yellow cards in that game. The second one was really unnecessary, if you ask me. The way he... He held down the jersey of the player while already down. It was for sure it was going to be a yell. And you can tell in his eyes when he's doing the fault that he's realizing, oh, damn, I'm on the yellow already. Why am I doing this? It's done. It's too late. I'm getting tired. He knew. Oh, well. Moving on. I guess we'll see Victor Cabrera back there. Hopefully, Sumare is back from that little knock that he had. So, yeah, that's about it. But more importantly, today on the show, we have two preview of games coming up this weekend. Another historical day this Saturday. First of all, it is the first game of the Montreal Impact in Major League Soccer at home. Their season home opener against Kaká and Orlando City. And to talk about that game, we have Christopher Kimball from Orlando Soccer Daily to talk about, well, Orlando City Soccer Club, talk about Kaká. Talk about Breck, Shea, Molino. Talk about the roster of Orlando. And talk about as well uh, the identity of the club, the character of Orlando, the type of formation they have to play. That's what we do. And after the Christopher Kimball interview, we'll come back to preview uh, 
another Super Bowl moment that will happen at the Big O. This time at 12.30 p.m. FC Montreal's first ever game in the USL versus Toronto FC 2. Or if you prefer Toronto 2 FC. Historical day. So we will be talking about this game by talking about their game they had last week. Their last preseason game. We'll talk about the roster. The players to look for for FC Montreal. And the type of identity. The type of roster and the type of play they like to do on the pitch. We'll talk about that after the Orlando interview. But first, from Orlando Soccer Daily, Christopher Kimball. See, it's one bit of magic from Kaka right at the end of this game. Well, they signed him for moments like these as we move into stoppage time. It is Kaka! Huge deflection and in! It's Kaka's goal, though. The superstar delivers in the nick of time. Orlando a level in stoppage time. Fantastic celebrations for the goal, for Orlando's goal. And welcome back to After It Works. It's with great pleasure that I welcome to the show a first-time guest, Mr. Christopher Kimball from Orlando Soccer Daily at Soccer Turn on Twitter. How are you doing today, Christopher? Doing great, Kevin. Thanks. Uh, my, you're welcome. Uh, Orlando is facing Montreal on their first, not their first, but their big, long trip up north to Montreal. Uh, mm-hmm. Mon- Orlando's having a pretty decent season so far with a win, a draw, and a loss. So one of everything since then. Uh, what is the feeling in Orlando to begin with? Uh, how is the, the attendance? We all heard about the bowl that was filled to start it. Uh, how has it been since then? It's been pretty good. I mean, I think all things considered, you have to be happy with the results that they've had. Yeah, they they probably could have gotten a draw in Vancouver the other day, so that was disappointing, especially the way that they lost it Mm -hmm. in the last few minutes of the game. Um, But overall, I think that the the vibe has been pretty positive. Obviously, the crowds have been great. There's been a lot of coverage of the team down here, Uh, and uh, they got the first win under their belt against Houston a few weeks ago. So uh, everyone's pretty positive. This week's a bit more of a question mark going into the weekend because of, you know, the the roster situation that the team is facing. But uh, we'll see how that goes and uh, hopefully get through that and and, uh, see what's past the next game. Speaking of the roster, we all heard about Kaká. It's been years we've been waiting for his arrival in MLS. Uh, How has he been playing and what other player has impressed you so far? Sure, yeah. Well, obviously, Kaká has been great. Everything that was advertised coming in uh, to the season, he's he's controlled the ball really well. He's been really strong on the ball. Uh, great distribution uh, to the players around him. He's, the passion that he's shown on the field has been outstanding. Um, you can really see the desire that he has to, to win the games. Um, and uh, the, the next player I would say who's been really looked really good there's a few but I, I think Kevin Molino for the most part is, has been um, a nice I wouldn't say a surprise because we knew the talent that he was coming in but you didn't really know how he was going to be at the MLS level he was clearly the best player in USL last year and so to see him transition into MLS effectively has has really been uh, a nice surprise and he's he's been really good he didn't have the best game against Vancouver uh, but uh, he's shown really the talent that he has on the ball and the quickness and the vision that he has. And he and Kaká have worked really well together in the early part of the season, uh, creating chances. They just haven't really been able to, to finish off those chances. But overall, Kaká and Molino have looked terrific, I would say. Uh, and the other nice surprise has been Rafael Ramos. He's a young player out of uh, the Benfica organization, Portugal, that they picked up. Uh, through their relationship with Benfica. And he's a, a right back, a young player. He's been really impressive on, on the right-hand side, defensively and also offensively, getting forward at appropriate times and uh, being an, a, an attacking threat. So that's been uh, really good to see because there were some question marks coming into the mm-hmm. season about the right-back position and uh, whether or not they had enough experience there uh, to, you know, to survive at the MLS level. So to see Rafael Ramos 
perform at that level has been uh, really good to see. Yeah, you mentioned some question marks before the beginning of the season concerning the right-back position, but I would make it more general in the defense as a whole. Yes, you have mm -hmm. outstanding players like Colin, but outside of him, you have a lot of young players too. And it seems for the first three games, uh, Orlando's been able to hold on, not be able to concede more than one goal and was able to, uh, even though they lost points late in games uh, for franchise, for a new yeah. franchise in three games, it's not too bad. Yeah, not bad. I mean, they've they've conceded two goals in three games. Um, and, you know, there were the first couple games, there were some problems. The, you know, the New York City game, there were some real good chances for the, the opposition there and even in Houston. Uh, so they've given up really good scoring opportunities to the opponents that they haven't just been able to score on. So that's good for the Orlando uh, players. But uh, last week against Vancouver, they look much better. Uh, they look a lot more coordinated uh, between them and uh, not quite so leaky. So that's good. And and like you said, there was some question coming in, not just with the right back position, but also really at the left back. I mean, no one really knew how quickly Brett Shea was going to adjust to, to playing that position full time. And he's been pretty good. You know, uh, there are things you could point to Uh, that he could improve on. But overall, he's been uh, pretty solid. And the two center backs, it's sort of been a rotation because uh, Relian Collins has been in and out with red card suspension. And they've got uh, two, two new guys come in, uh, Sean St. Leger and Seb Hines, who, who sort of rotate at the other center back position. And, and they've performed pretty well as well. So all things considered, for something that was kind of a big question mark coming in uh, to the season, I think you have to be happy with uh, what, what they've done so far. All right. Now it's one of the cliche questions when we're talking about superstars and major league soccer and turf. Uh, Orlando's coming to Montreal. It's going to be a turf game. Do you expect mm -hmm. Kaká to miss that game or the big stars of Orlando to my, maybe miss the starting 11th for that game? Because we're, we're used to not seeing the Henri of this world and all of that. Right. No, not at all. Kaká will be playing for lots of reasons. First, because he has to play for this team to be successful. Second of all, don't forget that Orlando is playing this year in the Citrus Bowl before they move to their new stadium. And the, the Citrus Bowl in Orlando is a turf field this season. So he's been playing on turf uh, for the home games so far this season, and he said that that's not going to be a problem for him, despite, as you know, you know, various injuries he's had the last few years with his legs and so forth. So uh, he's, he's saying he's going to play on turf and uh, I would expect that he'd be playing in Montreal. Not only that, but considering that uh, the, the roster is pretty much whittled down to probably 13 or 14 players at this point with all the call-ups and the injuries that they have, they can't afford to be without Kekka. There just aren't enough bodies at this point uh, for him not to play. And what do you expect of that game with the roster problems that the Orlando is facing right now? What do you expect for the big travel? And do you expect Orlando to have a result on a roll? Do you expect Montreal to finally get a win in MLS? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, like I said, the, the roster is it's, it's kind of uh, in tough shape because of all the call-ups. I mean, if they dress 16 players this weekend, I think they'd be happy with that. Um, there's going to be a lot of guys starting that haven't even played minutes yet this season. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how coach Adrian Heath decides to play it strategically. I, I have the sense that he might, um, try to just hunker down and, and get out of Montreal with the point, um, rather than he's, he's normally very devoted to his attacking strategy, possession oriented, um, play, but I think in this case he might choose to just um, try to get out of Montreal with one point and be happy because it's going to be so difficult for them against a, an opponent that's playing well to, um, to do much with the players that they'll have available who haven't played together uh, this season as a unit, uh, some guys that um, haven't seen minutes at all this season. So it's kind of going to be a, a sort of a a cut-and-paste type roster that they're going to put together, and, and we'll see how he does it. But I think to play a defensive game might be their best bet at this point. All right. Last question before I let you go, Christopher. 
What would mm-hmm. you say is the identity of Orlando City on the field? What is their type of soccer do they like to play? And uh, uh, what type of formation should we expect on Saturday? Sure. Generally speaking, they are a very possession-oriented team. Adrian Heath has a system, a 4-2-3-1, a system that he's used successfully uh, throughout uh, the USL pro days and now in MLS that he's um, been, you know, had great success with. So they, they keep the ball on the ground. They're going to do a lot of passing uh, and try to work up uh, through the middle generally. They'll use wing play a lot. Forwards will get forward. I mean, the fullbacks will get forward uh, quite a bit. Uh, but generally it's a, a possession-oriented and an attacking type style. Um, having said that, like I like I said, this weekend, it's hard to know if he's going to go that direction because he doesn't have the players really that he would normally have to execute that effectively. So uh, it's tough to say that he's going to do that this weekend. Maybe he'll go to more, um, maybe a 4-4-2 or something. But we'll see what he does. But I would say the character of, of Orlando City is, uh, yeah, possession, uh, uh, lots of passing, creative play through the midfield, uh, and uh, attacking football. It's very, it's an attractive game to watch. All right. Christopher Kimball, thank you very much for joining us on Of The Woodworks, and hopefully we'll get a good game and uh, the right team will get the points on Saturday. I hope so. That's right. Nice talking to you, Kevin. <laughs> thank you very much, Christopher. You're listening to Off The Woodworks, the only podcast entirely dedicated to the Montreal Impact and FC Montreal. You want to reach Kevin Laramie? Email off the woodworks at hotmail.com. Twitter at Kev Laramie or at Off the Woodworks. Subscribe on iTunes, Feedburner, Pod Bay, Play Your YouTube, everywhere you can listen to the show. Yeah, listen to me flow. And we're back on Off the Woodworks, and thank you very much to Christopher Kimball from the Orlando Soccer Daily for the Orlando coverage here for the home opener preview for the Montreal Impact. But the game that will be played before that game, before the Montreal-Orlando game, there's a, not more important, but there's another historical game that's going to happen before, and that's the first ever game for the FC Montreal, the team coached by Philippe Eulafroy, the director of the academy, the first ever game in the USL. And to commemorate that game, well, we're going to go through FC Montreal's roster, talk about the team, the players to look for, well, a couple of players about Toronto too that uh, we'll talk about it because yeah, it's the opponent on Saturday. So the four hole one derby travels down to the USL for its first ever installment in the USL. All right, first of all, uh, we'll talk about how Philippe Lafroy. Well, actually, you know what? Let's listen to Philippe Lafroy right now, and we'll come back on the show and talk about. Uh, talk about Philippe Lafroy and his uh, his team. So after your last preseason game, Philippe. How do you think the team is going to fare off in one week from now? What do you take from today's game as at least one thing to bring to the future? That when we we are confident enough, we can we can challenge any team. I think in, in this league. The problem is that we still we still sometimes kids uh, that they have to grow up very very fast because the first let's say 25 three minutes it was like kids against men and then when they realize that they can you know they can ch- challenge the men then now it's more interesting for us so what what the thing the positive thing is that when they they took into into consideration that they can challenge the this type of guys technically and tactically then we can we can do something very interesting so today we had the USL team versus an NASL team uh, there was a big size difference if you're looking at uh, Montreal compared to Ottawa. Montreal does have some big size players, but they were injured for this week. Yeah. Do you think this is going to be a problem in the future, or do you think maybe size is overrated for uh, in the soccer? Uh, size is overrated, uh, definitely. And uh, for us, it's uh, the talents, the, the, the physical aspect is uh, is, is more than explosiveness uh, type of things. And, and and for us, the the physical challenge doesn't exist if technique. If your technical abilities and tactical abilities are are, are, are good, 
you don't need a physical challenge because you're always ahead of the game and, and you have one second to do whatever you want. So you, you, can, you can release the ball before the, cha- the physical challenge comes. And you can, you, can be, uh, you can anticipate, you can in- inter- make some interception of, of the ball. Then you don't really need a, a physical challenge. The challenge that you can maybe meet is in the air because if you you know if you five, five uh, feet and the other uh, six, uh, six, then you have a problem. But, you know, we... we, we it doesn't mean we we don't want or you, you, we don't have physical very physical um, athletes we have, but but also you know we are, we, we we firmly believe that if your technical ability and tactical ability are good, physical aspect is secondary. So today against an ASL team Ottawa Fury. The goal was scored inside the first minute. So, do you consider this game a zero-zero or a one-nothing loss? <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, I think the, the, the Ottawa side will say it's a one-zero. In our side, we still say it's a one-zero because, uh, again, if, if, if we're starting a, a, any of our game the same way we're starting this one, we're going to be into trouble. And instead, maybe of one-zero, will be two-zero. So, it's a real one-zero. And, and, and we did we did not have a, a lot of opportunities. You know, maybe one. So it's not obviously, yeah, at the end. So obviously it's not enough. Uh, even if it was 0-0, we didn't have any chance to score. So we have to, 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 to be a little bit more comfortable on the ball, you know, better on the pressure. And and we, we, we don't forget that, you know, uh, six months ago we were playing a PDL with all of this group and, and that... Uh, uh, 100%, 100% of the team is composed of academy players. That you know, the average is 20 years old. So we know that we're gonna have, we're gonna face very big challenge at the beginning of the season. The thing is that we hope that they're gonna learn very fast, and after maybe a one, two months, they're gonna be able to, you know, to look great. Like the, the last 25 minutes, I hope we're gonna see that during 90 minutes. So basically, we're throwing them into the deep end, but they'll learn to swim eventually. Exactly. Thank you very much, Philip. Looking forward to the season next week. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. I am very interested about the approach that the FC Montreal and the Academy and Philippe Lacroix are going with this season in the USL. Taking a younger team, literally taking the Academy, taking a team that was having a good season in United States Soccer Development Association League, whatever it's called, USSDL back then, now it's whatever. They had the great time they had in the PDL, the great successes, championship and all that. That team, that core team that's been together for four or five years, you bring that team to a higher competition level all together so they can use the chemistry they've been built in the last couple of years against better opponents and see if their skills can match up. And yes, uh, when I was at the last, when I was watching the Ottawa game against Montreal last preseason game, there was a size difference. Yeah, we're not gonna lie. There was a big one, but even if you take that game as a microcosm of a season, all right. In that game, yes, at the beginning it wasn't easy. They were getting dominated. They were losing the aerial battles, aerial duels. But eventually, they found a way around that. They were able to get possession and move forward. They did not have a lot of opportunity, but they were able to get control of the game later on in that game. In the last twenty minutes, Montreal was actually moving forward and having possession of the ball in the last 18 yards of the other team. So it was getting closer for Montreal at the end of the game. And I think that's going to be the case for the season. It's a microcosm because in the season, it's not going to be hard at the beginning. It's going to be a different travel uh, travel schedule that they're used to, uh, more games that they're used to, and against better teams and teams that have been together for years when you talk about the standalone team in the USL, the Charleston Batteries and all that of this world. They're teams that are different. They're not the same. The first game is this Saturday. And that approach, let's just take the academy boys or kids. They're not boys, they're men now. They're all 20 year old average. So take the men of the academy, throw them in the deep end of the pool, make them swim. And eventually, if they swim, if they swim correctly, the ones that are going to crawl out of the pool, they're going to be better than the guys you bring at the super draft. And basically, that's the be-all, end-all of an academy. Make a couple of good product every year. But on the other side on the other side of that scenario, when you have a USL team, academy can products can become professional players and have a decent career on a lower division without even making it to the MLS. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, that's I see the pyramid of the academy finishing with FC Montreal and the Montreal Impact being a bonus. 
because just the USL itself is going to create more Canadian players, more Montreal and Quebec-born players, more players from our neck of the woods at the national and international level. It'll take a couple of years, but I believe that we're on the right path. And I believe finally we're having an almost complete pyramid from top to bottom. And you need that for development, for the future, and for the fans, for everybody. So if you're a fan of soccer in Montreal, there's no reason if you have a ticket for a Saturday's game in Orlando, well, in Montreal versus Orlando, if you get that ticket, come to the stadium early. Come to the stadium for 12.30. Come for the stadium for a great game. Montreal has a very good roster with players that you might have heard of before or you might not. So we'll take a look at the roster of FC Montreal right now. And I'll tell you a couple of uh, tidbits of information. And we actually have an interview that I did with James Jeffra at the end of last preseason game too. So, in the net, the goalkeeper that was starting the last preseason game against Ottawa was Yann Alexandre Fillon. Two other goalkeepers are with FC Montreal. Luca Leone and David Polmain. So those are the keepers. We're looking at the defense. Uh, the defense, a couple of very high right back and full backs and center backs, which will be pretty good in the air. We'll talk about that with gems later on. But we have John Dinkota, number 54. Number 60, Mitchell Bringoff. Number 61, Frank Zoué. Number 66, Januk Charbonneau. Number 68, Shakib Osine. Number 69, the guest on our show today, James Jaffrar. We have as well, Zachary Sukunda, number 73. And number 74, Mele Temgua. That's our defense. The midfield, a couple of names that you've heard before for sure. Zachary Amesudi, he's back in the Montreal environment after a very hard 2014 season that led him being alone to Ottawa, injuries, and eventually comes back to Montreal. He's uh, probably not going to play, I'm not going to lie, but uh, he's on the way back. And can't wait to see him on the pitch again. A player that had a big knock and would sub out of the game against Ottawa at around the 70-something minute, Alessandro Rigi. One of the most famous midfielders. He's a known in the academy product. He's a, he's a known product and one of the, the prospects for the Montreal future and future for FC Montreal. Number 49, Alessandro Rigi. I think he's doubtful for the game, being subbed off with a knee and leg problem in the last game. He had a harsh tackle. Hopefully, he's fine and we'll be able to see him debut for FC Montreal in the USL. Number 42, Jonathan Valley. We have as well in the midfielders, but he did play as a forward last game. Victor Ndi, number 45. Number 46, Philippe Lincourt-Joseph. Number 48, Kevin Luarca. We have as well Marco Lionel Dominguez Ramirez, a stud, number 50. Number 53, Mastanabal Kacher. Number 57, Yassin Ait Sliman. Number 59, Emma Douache, still in the midfield. Number 62, and the captain for the last game in preseason, Nazim Belguandouz. Number 71, Michael Bilak. And number 72, the famous small Swiss player, one of the only foreign players in the academy. He's been with the club for about three years now. Fabio Morelli, number 72. Good prospects. And a couple of forwards as well. We have number 63, Charles Jolie. And number 67, Frédéric Lajoie-Gravel. That is the roster. So 11 of those players will be playing against Toronto FC2 on Saturday, 12.30 p.m. And I cannot stress enough that the level of play, the level of skills, the level of talent that these players do have. The ceiling that they do have is higher than you think. And a lot of good things are going to come out of this team and this program. I am a believer of what Philippe Lafroy is teaching, the way he is approaching the game with technical, tactical abilities and skills before everything else. It is a standard-based everything. I love the way it's going. FC Montréal, 12.30 p.m. I want to see you at the stadium. 
I'll be there Saturday at 12.30. Let me know what you think about the game. It's going to be a great game. And let's support the future. And not just the future because they're pros right now. They're playing in a pro league. So the future is now. Let's support this team now. FC Montreal this Saturday, 12.30 p.m. Eastern at the Big O. Be there. Or be square. And someone that is going to be there is Jem Jeffra, number 69 for FC Montreal. I had the chance to talk to him post game about how he communicates with his defenders and how it's really important to him. It's a French interview, but basically what he's saying is uh, yes, it's part of his duties. He likes to organize his midfielders in front of him and helps use his body and his size to uh, help him in good position, but size is still a bit overrated. So, same message does trickle down from Philippe Lafroy downwards and with his skills, with his technique and tactics, they're able to overcome the physical advantages that the other team might have this season. So, uh, without further ado, here's Jem Jeffrard, and until next time, have a great soccer. Je suis toujours par Jem Jem Jeffrard, un joueur de FC Montréal, donc euh, latéral gauche défensif. Grosse game aujourd'hui contre la NASL Ottawa Fury. Je te voyais très, communiquer très souvent avec les joueurs devant toi, avec les milieux de terrain. Est-ce que c'est une partie de ton rôle? Est-ce que tu penses que diriger les milieux et organiser ton équipe est quelque chose de très important pour toi? Ben ouais, je trouve que c'est une des bonnes choses parce que quand ils savent qu'il y a quelqu'un derrière eux qui, qui leur parle, ils sont plus en confiance. Puis moi, dans mon jeu, à moi, ça m'aide beaucoup plus. Je trouve que communiquer, c'est une très bonne chose. C'est ce qui a sauvé un peu le match. Au début, on était un peu mollement dans le match. Le fait que je leur parle, je leur parle, je leur parle, je leur parle, ils sont excités dans la partie. Avec le but qui était marqué à la première minute, euh, donc du côté droit avec le, le cross, oui. comment, que vous, vous, comment que vous vous placez pour euh, recommencer comme si de rien n'était? Comment on se re... l'état d'esprit après un but dans la première minute? Bien, comme c'est en début de partie, après ça, on se dit il y a 88e minute à jouer. Donc, on se dit, OK, on a pris un but. Maintenant, on sait comment ça joue. On est prêt et on y va. Et comme vous avez pu le voir en deuxième mi-temps, ça a été mieux. Dernière question, j'aime. On voyait une grosse différence physique en comparé Montréal et Ottawa. Ottawa, des joueurs un petit peu plus âgés, un petit peu plus expérimentés, mais surtout plus, plus imposants. Est-ce que vous voyez une différence lorsque vous jouez comme, comme, comme ça sur le terrain? Oui, c'est sûr, mais nous, euh, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui nous dérange. On, on utilise plus les, nos qualités techniques pour s'en sortir. Fait que C'est ce qui va avoir toute la saison, on est prêt à ça. Si euh, techniquement, on arrive à compenser la difficulté physique, on va être bien. C'est ce que je sens. Merci beaucoup, Jem. Bonne saison. Merci à vous. Merci, Jack. Bonne saison.